And you'll see it in lineage. I've worked on like four generations in a row. And, but just because it's been there and it's genetic doesn't mean it's not changeable. And I'll say, who in your family looks like you? Bring me pictures. And you can see, usually right around the sphenoid is one of the telltale signs. There's something just a little not quite right. Is sometimes it's hereditary or genetic. Sometimes it's um, the birth process itself. And you know, they don't do so much with forceps deliveries. And one of the reasons I think is because they started getting lawsuits because this can induce learning disabilities because it comes right over the temporal and the sphenoid. So now they do, they suction the baby out. So they suck them up and hope that the brain parts go back the way the skull part forms the way it should. So sometimes it can be um, the birth trauma and the, the neck gets twisted and all you know terrible things can happen during that birth process. Um, sometimes allergies and, and can really wreak havoc. So well, I always do allergy work in the office too because if you're drinking milk and your ears get clogged and you have ear infections or you have you know eczema, it's hard to you can't even hear all the sounds coming in. So, you know, Tomati says you can't reproduce the sound you don't hear. So in the early formative years, when kids have repeated ear infections and tubes in their ears, they're missing important sounds. And so, you know, a lot of times then we have to do ILS or ABT or something so, so the kids can listen so they can open up their ears. Once their ears get better, then they have to hear those sounds sometimes for the first time. So, so allergies can have an effect or, or sugar, like, you know, I say sugar is evil. I remember my son playing with a, a kid, and the mom used to give them Kool-Aid. Well, this boy, it had red food dye in it, and it was lots of sugar. And then the kid would be wild for hours, and the mother would yell at him and scream at him, and I think, you gave it to him. <laughs> but, you know, and, and, and you watch in the classroom when it's some kid's birthday or it's Christmas or something, and the sugar treats come to the school, within an hour, you can just start pulling the kids off the ceiling. They can't sit still. They can't be quiet. And so, so diet has a big part to do with the ability to learn. And so, um, and concussions. You know, I have people who were fine until they had a concussion or two. And then it's like, it's like everything got knocked out of their head. And we have to start over from scratch and almost like rebuild them. But we can do that. Yeah, so there can be lots there can be lots of reasons why it comes in and trauma. You know, because when something traumatic happens, whether it's overt physical or sexual abuse or or something or perceived trauma from the child's perspective, we know that the hind brain ends up with seventy five percent of the energy of the brain. And so that's based on survival. And so there isn't very much left to learn. So trauma is a huge Deal. And again, I said, it's the child's perception. When if he's bullied, if he's called names, if, you know, the stories I hear that teachers say things to kids, it's like, and that they allow them to be a teacher. It's so cruel sometimes. And you don't always know what effect it would have on a child on a particular day. You know, one day something might have rolled off of him without perception. And if he had too much sugar or he's oversensitive, like it went in and it stabbed his heart forever. Yeah, my my uh, three-year-old grandson was very dramatic, still is. It was like, oh, it hurts my heart <laughs> at two and a half. And his father is going, don't let him get by with that. <laughs> and then he's bragging to his young, now he's seven and he's in school, and he's bragging like seven times. He tells his five-year-old brother in an hour, like, how, how, do, how good his grades are. And I said, how do you think that feels to somebody who didn't get those grades? And my five-year-old says, it's kind of like throwing up in your heart, you know? And then he said, oh, you know, you can't really do that. But, <laughs> but you know, from a child, so this is like what the child's perception is. Am I good enough? You know, so all of those things, whenever that happens, it stops learning. And so one of the first things in books and neurotherapy is like the big deal is working on trauma, is releasing it from the body. So that your so we can get fit, so this hind brain can feel safe and warm, etc. So the limbic brain, which is about caring and bonding and curiosity, and we have a reason to learn. If you don't have a reason to learn, forget it. If you don't feel loved and you don't think your parents care or nobody cares, why bother? You can be really smart, but if not, 
if you don't have the power turned on, it doesn't matter much. And so all of that has to be worked on before you get to the cognitive brain. You know, in Smart Moves, Carla has this, and I think I've seen it other places, but she has the stages of development of learning. So, you know, the first 18 months is our, is that reptilian brain, it's safety, survival, all these issues. And then comes the, the limbic brain, the caring, the bonding and attachment, and so on. And we have to watch that we do things at the appropriate time with kids. So around five or six, the right brain kicks in. And so that's our imagination. And, you know, kids can't tell what's real and what's not. I mean, it's all real when you're five and six years old. And so when somebody says something awful about you, that goes in as real, too. So we don't, in real, like reading, you know, we really shouldn't read until we're seven or eight when the left brain kicks in. So, and we shouldn't be doing, we should be doing near, far, near, far, near, far, a lot of far with our eyes to develop the eye muscles so that when we can read, we're not supposed to be looking, even little kids, you know, two and three years old come in my office and they're on their mommy's cell phone, near, 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 near. And so they're not exercising their eyes and they're not outside playing and they're not going near far and looking at roly-poly bugs and noticing the trees and stuff. So it's, it all, that all matters. It all matters. So the trauma is a big part of the part as well. Yeah, and it, like I said, it's all, over the, it's all over the world. And, you know, we see, when they say 105, I, I go, is that like really diagnosed? Because how many people are walking around, I call them closet dyslexics, because they're functioning, because they're smart enough that they can get by. And if they're girls, like I was, you're nice. And so you're not going to create the classroom disturbance like the boys are more likely to do. And whoever gets the most, you know, who's most disruptive in class gets the attention. And so there are these quiet ones who don't get noticed but who really, and they're getting by, but they're not being all they could be. If somebody really went tell me who you are really, you know, and find out like what their real skills are and so on. 